Okay, so I'm here with Chloe Beefcake going. Uh, we're going to be talking about she's got an upcoming fight. We're going to talk. We're going to delve into why she got into MMA and and what's kind of led here to led her to here. So I want to thank you very much for your time. First of all, the nickname. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> always brought up. Yes. Um, how did that come about, or is that something you don't want to talk about? No, yeah. So I fought at the Four Nations uh, last June, I think it was now. I uh, haven't had a nickname the whole time running up to it. And I was training and I first met uh, Kian and Kian was in my corner um, helping out my coach, Mitch, at the time. And I was warming up with him back at, like backstage and everything. And I was like getting in the fight zone. And he uh, he was like talking and he was like, God, your like, back is like absolutely wham. He was like, you're like a fucking beefcake. And I was like laughing. And he was like, that should be your nickname, essentially. And it just kind of run from there. Like the rest of the weekend, like he was calling me beefcake. And I thought it was quite funny. I was like, do you know what? That would be actually quite a funny nickname. And I went home to all my housemates and I was speaking to them about it. And it stuck with them as well. And they've just been calling me it since as well. So all of my housemates call me beefcake all the time. And it's kind of just, it kind of stuck. And I was like, it's not a bad nickname. And a lot, a lot, a lot of people have beefcake. I didn't want like a, you know, the generic nickname either. So it, it's stuck and it, yeah, it's doing good at the moment. And definitely people ask about it, which is, it's a good factor to it. Yeah, because you're always going to get questions about, and it's good that it's kind of given to you, because a lot of fighters want to come up with their own nicknames. That's they it. Kind of I didn't want to do that. I think it's a lot better when someone kind of christens a fighter That's with a it. nickname. Um, there's a fighter over here. They call him the mini fridge. He absolutely hates it. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it's good to be given. So, uh, you, I want to say you're going on to your seventh fight, is it? Eighth, six eighth. and one. So eighth fight. That's... Yeah, eighth fight. Yeah. Yeah, eighth fight. So, but to get to here, where did you start? What What led you in down the route of MMA? So I grew up doing judo. I've done judo since I was like a little kid, since I was eight years old. Uh, uh, and I've I progressed like quite quickly through the ranks of judos till I was about 16 and then I there was a lot of political drama within judo so I kind of dropped it off and I was like this is shit like don't want to do this anymore um, and so I stopped maybe for like a good year or so and I was like thinking about it and I was like I don't really want to not do anything with the rest of my life and I was speaking to my dad like a little bit about things and he found Impact Gym over in Bristol. And he was like, there's some amazing coaches. Like I've heard some like good guys that come out of here and this, that and the other. So me and my brother went down for a session and I absolutely loved it. And it's it's stuck since. And I just got into MMA and just transitioned from like the one sport to the next. And yeah, I haven't looked back. And then I was like halfway through and I was like, I want to fight. Like I want to get out there and I want to do the whole experience. And that was it. Had my debut and then flying since. So And how was it transitioning from one sport to another? I'd say it's fairly seamless being judo and, mm. and uh, uh, everything that's involved in that sport. What was the transition like for you? Was it just like another combat sport for you? Yeah, so I obviously the striking was the hardest aspect to learn for me. Like the judo and like the wrestling side of things flowed quite well. It was just a matter of learning like the kind of grips that I needed without the gi on. And like the jujitsu is somewhat in with the judo. Like there are some things that are off limits. So I've had to like learn a lot of the leg locks and those sorts of things. But I think the transition with it being MMA, I could definitely bring a better grappling focus to my MMA fights. And I've slowly and surely started to bring up my my boxing and my kickboxing and just, like worked a lot on my pts and stuff like that so it was just a matter of like diving head first learning the the parts that i didn't know so well and then just combining it with like all my wrestling and like some of the stuff that i learned from judo anyway so i didn't find it too hard but yeah it's just the striking was definitely a whole other aspect and a whole other cardio that i had to work on as well and is that something that obviously when you moved over and you realized it was a, a brand new monster for you to unpack, mm -hmm. did you then go heavily in on the strike and to try and bring it up to the same level as the rest of your game? A hundred percent. Yeah. I didn't want to go in and just be like, okay, well, I'm really good at throwing and taking someone down and like subbing them. Like it would probably work out for my, like my first two fights, especially against like lower experienced girls. But like, as you slowly progress through the ranks, you need to, you need to have a whole game with MMA. And I'd rather be absolutely like amazing at everything than just really sick at like the jujitsu and everything like that. But as soon as I go out there against somebody who's like an experienced kickboxer and get my head blasted off before I can even close the distance, it's just like, it's not an option. I'd rather 
be really good with my kickboxing and have it a good enough level that I can compete with these girls. And then know I've got like my grappling and my judo in my back pocket so that when I can, like I can match that and then I can take that like even further with all my other skills and stuff like that. So it wasn't really an option just to like be like, fuck the kickboxing and tick it off. I want to dive right in and learn the whole thing. And I've slowly gotten better at the kickboxing. Well, I hope so anyway. I hope my coaches agree as well. So I'm sure they will if they're sending you out into competitions. I hope so. They, they would surely agree like that. Like you said, you've got a very good record. But when, like you were saying, we're now learning the strike and do, do you stand as, as long as you can? And like you said, keep that in the back pocket. Because a lot of times you see fighters will, they will actually work on their weaknesses like yourself and then kind of use it as a strength. So they stand on the feet with someone mm. when someone goes, oh, I don't like getting hit. And then they try to take it down and then they go, oh, well, this was a bit of a mistake now as well. A hundred percent. Yeah, it definitely depends on the type of girls. Like I fought and fought some kickboxers and I was like, fuck this. I'm just going to go like straight shoot in. And then there was been other like fight strategies where I've been like, OK, well, I think I'm better than you on the feet. So why am I not going to stand there and then turn them into a wrestler? And exactly like you said, as soon as they shoot in, I'm like, well, I, I like grappling anyway. So that's a strength to me as well. So definitely it helps to be better on the feet as 100 percent. so i'm glad i put in the work and i can i can use the striking as part of a strategy and a game plan rather than me speaking to my coaches and being like my striking is not up to par and having the same strategy going into every single fight otherwise i think i'd be figured out quite quickly as well to be fair yeah like that you said you'd get away with it for a couple of fights but if you get someone who's high level all of a sudden it's it's not going to be a, a nice it's hard. fight but you said when obviously you would have competed in judo and then you said you kind of wanted to compete in MMA once you kind of got the feel for it. I know they're both combat sports, but talk to us about like your amateur debut or even your novice debut. What mm. were the feelings like the week before, like the nerves? How did it feel to walk into that cage for the first time and actually the door shut behind and this is it, it's, it's go time? It's completely different feeling to ever everything I've ever felt. Like I, I competed at a really high level within judo anyway. But the majority of the time, there's probably like four or five mats going on in an area. And it doesn't feel so much that people are all watching you at the same time. Whereas when you're in the cage, you're the only person fighting at that time. And even if people aren't there to support you, they're going to be watching you. And I remember maybe like the week before, I was a little bit nervous, but I was itching to get in there. I had a really, really, really good camp. Um, but I remember my walkout and I've never had a walkout before and I remember being like halfway through the walkout and I actually thought I was gonna like fall into tears I get just it was it was so overwhelming not even like because I was sad or I didn't want to do it it just felt so overwhelming like the music's blaring people are screaming there's like this fucking huge camera just in your face as I was walking down and I was like oh my god I was like I need to get it together and I like switched and I got it together and then as soon as I was in the cage like I, it's kind of it sounds stupid but when you're in there you don't think about anything else I can't I can't hear anyone like the only people I can hear are my coaches. And I got in there and I finished it in like a minute and a half. But I remember like it was the best feeling in the entire world. And that probably gripped me from the get go. The fact that I finished the fight, I was in and out and back into the backstage within like five minutes. And I was like, oh my God, like I, that was bloody amazing. And I was on a high for so, so, so long after. And I think that probably gripped me from the get go to be fair. I was like, this is a bloody amazing feeling. It's like nothing you'll ever experience. I can imagine, did I? It was ground and pound. Mm. Like, you finished that one with, was it? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I managed to, I hit the tape down from the get go, just went in, just went to a game plan, shot, because I knew I was really good um, at like the wrestling, shot, managed to like get straight into the mount and finish with the ground and pound. And like, I, I remember hearing my coaches all the way through, like, he was like neon belly. And as soon as I got to mount, I heard nothing. Didn't hear any of my coaches. I just started punching. Yeah, that that was it and then they pulled me off her. I was like this is fucking sick started running around the cage and everything and like I do watch myself back in some fights and like you are a different you're a different person in the cage I'll see some fights back and I'll I'll be talking shit in the cage but like in a real life situation I would never ever be talking shit to anyone in real life so you are a different person I watch myself back and I'm like who the hell is that but but it's also mental as well I think when it's just mm. the two of you in there if I think the mental edge can have a lot to do with so if you're talking shit to your opponent and they're maybe nervous. It's mad, it's mad how you went from nearly wanting to ball into cry to absolutely yeah. destroying your opponent to being That's absolutely it. elated. And like you said, obviously you've got used to that now, but mm. I think a lot of fighters when they come in don't realise it's not just about getting in and fighting. 
the event in itself is yeah. is is a lot to deal with. Like how how have you over time learned to deal with that better than obviously you done well your first time, but how have you learned to deal with like the backstage waiting because that's another pain in the hole sometimes waiting to go out. Have you learned to deal with that over time? It's just experience. Like the first time going out there, I I don't think I mentally put myself in that space and like. Uh, knew how I was going to feel walking out but as soon as I felt that I have never felt that since like anytime I've walked out uh, since I've just like walked out and just done my thing and a lot of the time before fights it's a lot of mental prep before the fights I think like I'll sit down I'll think how I'm going to feel during the walkout or I'll think through how I'm going to feel stood there or how I'm going to finish the fight and it's a lot of like it sounds stupid to say but like almost like manifestation to a little bit I love to like sit and like think about okay this is what's going to happen backstage this is what's going to happen in the fight and I'll picture myself like either finishing the person or like what kind of situations are fit like being in the fight and then when you end up in the, those like those situations in the fight you're not gonna it's, you've already been there mentally before so you feel it feels more natural and the more you get out there and the more you do it like I have not, I have not, felt, luckily I touch wood, I've not felt the urge to cry walking out since the, <laughs> since the debut. So I touch wood, I've never felt like that again. But like you said, sitting at that backstage and just waiting is a pain in the ass sometimes. And I think just not letting your like adrenaline get levels get too high and crash before you're getting out to the fight. You want to stay so level, so calm. And sometimes it's hard watching the people like warm up and everything that you just want to like, you want to get amped up as well. You just have to sit there, keep calm. And I think my coaches play like a big part in that as well because they've been through it so many times. They're like, look, we're not going to hit pads yet. Like you need to chill the fuck out, put some music on and just chill. And then when it's time to warm up, you'll slowly, slowly bring yourself up. And hopefully the timing's right enough that you bring yourself up, you walk out and then you send it during the fight. Yeah, I like the way you said your coaches will know your kind of your time. And if they know you're on in five fights, they know kind of, what time to start doing this to get your adrenaline kind of peaked at certain times. Um, because there is cases where true. fighters might get nervous or or excited. And one fighter told me they actually had their adrenaline and adrenaline dump before the fight and they felt like spaghetti then going out. So it's good to have obviously your coaches. Yeah. Like, it's um, a timing thing. It really is. It's, if you like, trust your coaches, you'll be fine. A hundred percent. And you talked about, obviously, the Four Nations there. It's something I was quite interested in in the past two years. Talk to us about being part of that event, because I'd say you were so proud to represent your country in that. Talk to us 100%. about that, the selection process and kind of the event as a whole and how you done. Yeah, so uh, for me, the Four Nations, I absolutely loved it. It was the first ever tournament style that I had been in. So I've been on a lot of fight nights, so... The fact that I had to go out and I was fighting by like 11 a.m. was kind of a weird concept to me. Like I had my breakfast and I was warming up backstage and I was out to fight. It was kind of nice. Like I've now that I've done it, it's quite nice to just do everything and then you get to finish for the day and you don't have to worry about anything else. Um, but it was I was great to go out there, represent like England for like the first time and to be selected as part of the squad. It was a lot of mess about with weights and everything like that i ended up fighting up uh two weights above the category just so i could get the fight there was nobody in flyweight and straw weight because obviously you weigh in the same day straw weight wasn't even an option for me anyway so i went up to bantam weight i was definitely definitely no i can say it now because i've already been there done it and won it but before I was so nervous, I was like, these girls are going to be fucking big and they're going to be scary. And I was getting myself a little bit amped up. But when I went out there, it felt like it felt like any other fight that you've ever done. Um, it's just a bit weird doing you weigh in the same day, you do the whole thing, you eat and then you don't know what time you're fighting. and You have to schedule it around watching all of the other fighters. Like it does get into a bit of a long day uh, type of thing. But it was absolutely amazing. And like the selection process going out, I went to a couple of the Emma sessions and worked my ass off. And luckily I got the message and got the pick and I was part of the squad. And it was just a matter of figuring out a weight and went there, smashed it. So I can't complain. There was no complaints. And it's nice doing those tournament styles where you have a selection of girls. Like I fought a kickboxer on the day, fought a better grappler on the second day. So like you're kind of learning on the job or changing your strategies depending on who's won the same day as that sort of thing. So I feel like you definitely learn a lot more 
doing those tournament styles and the fact that it's just down the road and like Emma are doing the whole Four Nations tournament, it's just like, it's easy work. Whereas the Worlds, you're getting the same sort of thing, but you're paying out lots of money for the flights and you have to go to a different country. And that's a whole other aspect. The fact that I could just pop down to South Wales and fight for the weekend, get two fights in the bag was great. And it's great for the record, great for the experience. Like I'd highly recommend doing tournament styles to any fighter because you just, you get the experience and especially at amateur level, like if you're doing a camp and then you fight and then you do another camp and then you fight, you're probably going to get like three fights in the year if you're active anyway. The fact that I could do a camp, smash out two fights and then you're laughing really. So it's good to get the experience level up and I would highly recommend it to anybody who's at like amateur level to like get the record in, get the experience in and just, yeah, go out there and enjoy yourself because it's a whole other thing to fight nights, 100%. Yeah, no, I, I like it. Like you said, with the Worlds and the Europeans, it costs so much, you see. It does. Like having to start gold fund me, beg, borrow, and steal sponsors, which, are, like, because there's so many fighters now, there's so many, there's not that many sponsors to give out. But one thing, I obviously, because you went up weight, it, it wasn't so bad, but the making weight each day, that's actually something that we have to do in the Republic of Ireland here, is that's oh, yeah. for, an ordinary, for an ordinary fight night, We it's a day of weighing for amateur pro, is usually pro rules. But mm -hmm. because you were up the weight, that obviously didn't affect you that much, no? I was eating breakfast in the morning. <laughs> I remember getting my hair done. I was eating my bowl of cocoa shreddies. And I was like, I don't have to... There was no stress levels with the weight. Like, when I stood on the scales, I was, like, a kilo and a half under. So I was like, there was no worries about that extra bit of worry, which was, it's nice, you know? Like, I could just go in, stem on the scales, get the job done. And I felt fully refueled, which a lot, not a lot of fighters sometimes experience, especially on the day of. And I was really early on, on like on both days, I was fighting by 10, 11 a.m. So you have to get up, get yourself ready. Like if you have to cut weight in the morning as well, that's that would have been a whole other task for me. So the fact that I could just wake up, do my thing, eat, go and fight was a lot easier, you know? So I, I dread the fighters who are on early and they're weight cutting and weight cutting in the morning as well or just not refueled enough because they haven't had the time throughout the day. So yeah, that definitely played a good factor for me, I think. I think I was just a bit worried that, you know, I'm not very... I'm not very tall. I'm only like 5'2", so I was just worried about the girls being a little bit taller than me and stuff like that. But it clearly didn't play enough of a factor in my head that I thought it would, you know? No, it like that. It was good. Like I said, you thought you were going to go in. They might be strong. Well, obviously, you you won your fights there. So it did, obviously, That's technique beats size sometimes in most cases. That's it. Obviously, that was the case. But you talked about, obviously, getting the two fights in one day and and three fights a year, if you're doing fight nights, would be extremely active. What's it like getting matched as a female in England or the UK at the minute? Because I know in Ireland, they were struggling and starting to get better. Obviously, it'd be the same there. Obviously, you've got Molly, you've got Chanel Dyer, someone mm -hmm. very high on, and Dakota. You've got kind of girls like they're kind of leading the way at the minute. Have you seen an uprise in females taking up martial arts because of these types of people? Definitely. Like there's a lot more females. I was saying recently, there's a lot of females at the gym that are training as before. There was probably only like two or three, but we've like at our gym just at the moment, there's, there's been lots of girls that started the jujitsu and stuff like that. And now you can see a little bit of an incline in girls that actually want to put the gloves on and start fighting as well. You know, uh, I still think it's hard to get matched as a female, but maybe a little bit better than before. Um, it's just a matter of like pullouts. I think it's quite easy sometimes to find people that want to fight in your weight group to some extent. But that being said, if you have a pullout, like even if it was two weeks before, in my head, I know the fight's over already. Like we're not going to fight. You're probably not going to find anyone. The likelihood of finding a replacement is very slim, I think. And I've seen a lot of girls, especially recently, like I've know I've spoken to a few girls who've had pullouts, uh, like really, really close to the fight, and there's no chance for a replacement. Whereas I know with a lot of the guys there's so bloody many of them if someone pulled out a week before they'd be able to get someone in and they'd still have a match on whereas in my head i'm like well that's done then you know there's no point finishing the weight cut or doing any of this because it's just not going to happen but luckily enough i've only had maybe like two pullouts in my career so i'm going to keep touching wood and hopefully plow through but i know i know speaking to a lot of other girls it's hard to get matched up it's hard especially when going higher through like the experience ranks like finding people who are similar records as me especially for fight nights and stuff like that is starting to get a little bit harder because a lot of the girls try and turn pro around the same like record that I am and they're just like well I'm better off going pro getting paid and I'm probably going to find a lot more female fighters at the pro ranks which is totally fair but it's making it a little bit harder 
going a little bit higher into the ranks that to find a little few females and stuff like that. Yeah, it is like that. It is getting better and better. And like you said, once you get a pull out, I'd say the whole female, all the different weight classes is probably the equivalent of one of the male weight classes. So every female from straw weight to bantam weight, fly weight, uh, feather weight, if there is some, I'd say with the amount you have could probably fit into one of the male male categories because there's so many. Like men could have a pull out on the day before and still get a fight. You know the sort of How disheartening is it? to have a pull out as a fighter like what's your experience has been yeah it's been shit you know like you're put in the work or you're in camp and like you get into a different mind frame when you're in camp you're eating the right foods you know and like i live in a house of full of students and they all want to go out to the pub and they want to do this or like their birthday is coming up and i'll go to the events but i'm sober the entire time it just it it pisses you off when somebody pulls you pulls out and it feels like all that hard work is for nothing. And I know that's not the case, but I know that's how a lot of girls feel. They're just pissed off. But like the real work and the real journey is in the camps. And if you've completed a full camp and had not had the chance to fight, you've still improved yourself as a fighter. You know, you've put in the work, you've like learned lots and lots and lots through the camp. It's just shit that you can't showcase your skills sometimes. And that's that's what it boils down to. And I think that's what pisses a lot of people off. But ultimately, you do get better as a fighter, but it just doesn't taste as sweet when you haven't got the victory at the end as well. Yeah, it's like that. You improve during that time, but you don't get the cherry on top to be That's able to it. show everyone. Because obviously, you're like you said, your student friends, your family, they all know you've been trained for this fight. You want to go out and show them what you're capable of and what you've been learning. You want to show yourself. You want to show your teammates, your coaches. And then when it doesn't happen, uh, you touched on stuff yeah. there, obviously, that you 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 missed out on obviously you'd be going out and you'd have to be sober you you wouldn't be able to eat the food you want talk to me as a fighter and as a person as a human being how hard is it like what sacrifices do you have that everyday normal people don't have just for people who might not be that savvy with MMA and what kind of you go through obviously I know but talk to people what what sacrifices do you make that an ordinary person doesn't have to make especially during camp like my my girlfriend definitely gets pissed off with me putting up with me especially through wake up <laughs> like I do thank her all the time especially after fights when I feel a little bit better and I've got a bit of pizza and some drinks in me but like the shit that she puts up with like I'm constantly I'm in the gym in the morning or and I'm in the gym in the evening you know at prime time like she'll come home from work and I'll be like right I'll see you later because I'm at the gym and then she won't see me till I'm home at night and it's 9 p.m I'm tired, I'm pissed off, I feel a bit battered and bruised, I haven't eaten the food that I want to eat, you know, and then it's hard, you know, making dinner, and not only do I have to make dinner, I have to then weigh out everything, and not all the time do you want to sit there and, like, weigh out your fucking vegetable oil, and it just sounds so stupid, and not a lot of people will sit there and cook for me, and, like, actually weigh out everything, and I'd rather... Like, I'd rather do it myself if you're not going to, like, do it properly. And my girlfriend has been the only person that I have ever met that will actually sit there and, like, pour out the vegetable oil, make sure she, like, weighs it and weighs this and weighs that. So it definitely, it helps having someone extra that, like, is a bit of emotional support. But I know for a fact that I piss her off on a daily basis. But it's the food and everything, you know, like, when calories are starting to come down. Like, I won't lie, you get moody, you know? You want to eat just the chocolate bar, but you can't have a chocolate bar because it goes over your calorie intake. And, like, living with a bunch of students who, like, go out constantly and they love to drink, or even, like, it's sunny now, like, everyone's going out and having a drink in the pub. And it's not the same going to the pub and having a Pepsi Max or having a glass of water. It just, it's, not, it's not the same. Like, I don't have the same atmosphere. And, like, the weekend just gone, my housemate uh, had a birthday party, and she threw the party at our house and like it was 11 p.m i was really sober and i just went to bed you know and it's just it's it's shit you know you want to be out there you want to be having shots and doing your whole thing but it's nice when you get the reward at the end and everything feels so much worth it so that's why it's shit when people pull out because you know you've, you feel like you wasted it i'd be like oh, well i could have had a drink there i could have celebrated i could have done this could have done that but you know sometimes it is what it is and i feel like a better person for it sometimes but I definitely, I piss a lot of people <laughs> in the house. I definitely do. I, I'm a little bit antisocial, I think, when, like, especially when I'm in camp, because there's no point going out and almost tempting yourself with what you could have had. And, like, when you're seeing people drink and, like, do all the things or eat the food or have a takeaway, you know, like, I'd rather just be antisocial and just go do my thing, go to the gym constantly and then I come home, cook my chicken and rice and then just 
chill out you know so I don't think a lot of people get how much work it is to try and balance a social life as well as work and go into the gym twice a day as well like it's a lot to balance and I think my social life definitely comes last especially when I'm in camp I'd, I'd rather not go out I'd rather not see anyone I'd rather go to the gym do my work eat my food and then sleep and repeat for the next eight weeks you know so it is, it's a sacrifice I think for my friends and my family a lot more so so I'm, I'm glad I've got a good like a lot of team around me that understand it and understand what I do because I don't think without that I'd just be I'd be a lone wolf just doing my thing and just going to the gym back and forth to be honest yeah no it is it is a big sacrifice you're that's what everyone says is there's a zero to there's very little to zero social life in it but that just shows a great discipline the fact that you can go out and you can have your water or your coke but I'd say the party in your house <laughs> probably kills you because if you're in the pub, you can go home. When you you couldn't go home to get away from this one because the party was in your home. But it that was being, rough. That being said, it's like even when you said it comes to weighing food, that's like when I go if I go downstairs, right, I'm gonna make food. I'm not weighing out myself. I just throw whatever I want in whenever I want. That's People it. don't understand the time between training, preparing food, work, trying to see your friends mm -hmm. and family, spend time with your girlfriend. Like you said. There's very little of that. And then there's also a financial cost in all this as well. Like you've got gym fees. You have to be eating the right food, uh, yeah. equipment, uh, travel to train and maybe yeah. events. I don't think people understand how, how a lot. it actually is put in. And especially at amateur level, you don't gain anything from this only experience. Not you, don't, a penny. Sorry, you don't gain anything financially. You gain mm. a lot of things in experience and, and other things. But how hard is that? the financial side of it as well 100 uh just recently i've moved from an admin job into training full-time so i've been really blessed that i found uh, a good enough job that can pay my bills and stuff doing like coaching kids martial arts and i get to travel around with my work and help launch other kids martial arts schools in and around like the uk and stuff so i've luckily found a job that suits my lifestyle and i can start putting in with more pts and stuff but before that, I was doing a 42 hour working week. And then on top of that, I was coaching the kids school so that I could actually start to work on the kids like businesses and stuff like that so that I could actually leave my admin job and just do that solely. So working the two jobs and training literally every single evening and then doing all of that on top of that was hard fucking work, you know, so I don't envy the people who have to do a 40 hour week as well on top of that. You know, I've been quite blessed that just recently I can leave that admin job and I can train full time and I can coach full time and do something that I really enjoy. But yeah, it's hard, you know, especially with the work and financial. It took me so long to get the, the business up to where it is that I could actually leave it and just solely do everything that I love. But that's a whole sacrifice in itself. I was like, okay, cool. Like if I want to have the money in, I've got to work like a 60 hour working week so that I can get to where I want to be and that was a whole sacrifice in itself you know so I'm lucky I've gotten to the point where I can actually do that and but the financial aspect of everything like you said is hard you know pay, you're paying for your nutrition I pay for my like, strength and conditioning I pay for like extra PT sessions so that I can get like one-to-ones to get my striking ability up and then like you said gym fees like nutri like I pay for all of the extra shit that I wouldn't have in my food shop you know like all the chicken and like the protein powder it's just it's a lot extra and like you said you don't get a penny for it like especially doing the tournament styles that i have done recently i have not collected a penny on ticket sales in a long 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 time yeah so it it is tough um but that's all part and parcel of it and it's part of the journey mm -hmm. it isn't ideal but it will pay dividends going forward so obviously you've got a fight coming up do you want to talk to us about your fight coming up yeah, I'm really excited for it. Uh, title fight on Cage Warriors Academy uh, April 6th. So I think I'm about just over 30 days out. I think something like that. I've got a countdown on my phone, so I'm making sure I'm keeping track. Um, but yeah, it's going really well. The weight cut is going uh, well at the moment. I feel good. I feel strong. Uh, I'm just up for work in Sheffield at the moment. So I've just gotten some rounds in with some really good girls. My weight as well, which is sometimes hard to come by. Sometimes it's a lot in your gym you're training with guys that are similar weight but it's not quite the same so to have the opportunity to like I said travel with the work and everything I've managed to like pick some girls and come down and train and do that extra work so yeah I'm feeling really good really strong Louise is a good lass she is I think she'll she'll definitely put in the work and she'll definitely come out there and we'll have a good scrap which is all I want you know just to actually find someone that I can 
know that's like that i know has worked hard and we can go out there and put on a fucking show because that's all it's about at the end of the day i like to put on a show yeah and obviously it's cage warriors academy it's for a title when you found out that's Oscar's gonna be fighting for a title on cage warriors academy because obviously cage warriors we all know what cage warriors is and the, the rules too obviously what was it like being asked to fight for a title on that how what was your emotions like it was great. Uh, I was meant to be doing the Europeans, but there's been some internal stuff. So the Europeans kind of fell through. So I was kind of like in a weird limbo stage where I was like, I'm not going to fight till June when the next Four Nations is. And I was like, I can't wait six months to find a fight. And a lot of places have been booked up because I was I was prepping for the Euros. Um, so I was like scrolling through Instagram and me and Louise follow each other on Instagram. And she, she posted a story and she was like, April 6th, I'm looking for someone to fight. Uh, who wants it and I sent her a message I was like yeah let's get it like let's go and we spoke a little bit between us and I spoke with my coach and she managed to speak with her coach and we managed to get it sorted and arranged and it wasn't official until the fight poster put out so as soon as the fight poster came out I was like amazing it's set to go and like you said everyone knows Cage Warriors and Cage Warriors Academy uh, is now officially owned by Cage Warriors so it's an, it's a, an official link in so to go out and win the title on that is it's an extra belt to the collection and like you said, it's a, it's a good route in as well. So it's it's a high prestigious event within the UK and it's one that everybody knows of. So can't go wrong with it. No, you can't. I like the way you kind of organised the fight between yourselves as well. We did. <laughs> um, it was pretty good. I've heard of that happen with a lot of females because obviously you would all follow each other and follow each other's journeys. That's it. And sometimes, not that promoters aren't aware of these fighters, but they might not think. Whereas Louise might have came up first in your feed, whereas I could have a thousand male fighters and she could be <laughs> in, in the middle there. Whereas I've heard that a few times and it's quite cool that you're able to do that, have a chat and actually organise it yourself. Um, I want to wish you the best of luck coming up to your fight. Obviously, I'm going to keep my Thank eye you. on it. Um, uh, I'm going to let you go. Is there anything you want to say before you go or anyone you want to shout out? I want to thank you very much for your time and I've really enjoyed this thank conversation. You. And hopefully we can do it again just after your title fight if you'd be interested a hundred percent i'd be well up for that and hopefully it's all smiles all around when i win the belt otherwise it'll be a very sad interview my end 100 <laughs> percent um shouting out wise i obviously want to shout out all the guys from the gym uh my strength and conditioning coach grapple machine my nutritionist all of my sponsors bruce house the sports tape my coach mitch and definitely my girlfriend otherwise she's gonna get upset if i don't shout her out as well because she has been on a big support all the way throughout this like all of the guys all know who they are all the way from impact gym like every single one of them that train and put up with me and like let me piss them off constantly i there's big love to all of those guys 100 percent Perfect. Yeah, you had to give the girlfriend a shout out because especially I had her, to, you know, with she's her the weighing out your food, you, you're kid. not going to find someone else like that to <laughs> weigh out the food. So you need to keep That's her happy and keep her there because obviously she's a big emotional support as well for you That's going it. forward. I want to thank you so much for your time. It's been an absolute pleasure to speak to you, and hopefully we'll speak again soon. Thank you very much.